Uh, Mr. President, thank you for having me. Rajiv, thank you. Um, it's an absolute honour being here, ladies and gentlemen. It really is. Uh, I, I walked into the room rather nervous, and uh, there's a very friendly camaraderie amongst uh, the people in this room, as, as, as is typical, I guess, of Rotary. But um, I think the first person I saw was uh, a gentleman I see on the beach at Port Wollonga, and uh, we played bad golf together at uh, Royal Adelaide Golf Club, David Mottram. And then my, my dear old friend, uh, Rob Turner, thank you for coming along, Rob. I know you had other commitments, but um, one of the good guys of real estate. And then Kay Dowling pulled me aside and said, um, do you remember me? And I, I'll be honest, Kay, in the first, in, in the first, I was a lot younger. Uh, I was a lot younger 38 years ago too. The, um, and she said, you sold my house. I said, I remember it, more the street only. And um, anyway, I did remember Kay, didn't I? And thank you. And in that same year, um, earlier in the year, which was my first year of real estate, I worked with Trevor Sterling, uh, who was my wonderfully efficient boss at uh, Big W Parabanks. Uh, Trevor was a lovely, lovely man. We had a mutual dislike of Woolworths, uh, hence my move into real estate and um, and Trevor's some years, years later uh, in, into other pursuits. But um, it's I could go on about the people in the room, uh, but thank you for making me so welcome. The, um, uh, yes, uh, Jeff, thank you for your introduction. Um, usually when I get up here, people groan because it, it means uh, it means a, uh, a charity auction. So uh, thanks for not groaning. I get a half-hearted round of applause and then a groan and then for the next 20 minutes I abuse the eardrums of <coughs> those at the lunch. But I love Rotary, I really do. Dad loved Rotary. He was a very, very loyal and uh, well-serving member of Rotary. Uh, as uh, Jeff said, he was a member f at age 24 in 1954 he joined and uh, Theberton and uh, finished up in uh, 2009, we think, uh, 55 years later. And I, I guarantee you, um, I've, I've got his 100% uh, attendance record for the years, 1954 to 2004. So, and, uh, I proudly wear his Paul Harris Fellow. I hope that doesn't offend anyone, but I did get approval. And uh, this proudly sits on my bookcase in my study, and he's got his Paul Harris. So I'm proud of my dad. He's a good man. And um, so he, dad passed away a few years ago, but had a fantastic life. Um, but I remember his four-way test always in his study, and you know the, you know, in the things we think and say and do, and is it the truth, and you know the rest. Uh, but he was very, very proud of his Rotary heritage. Um, the uh, service above self, I remember it well. We had exchange students galore, uh, which we loved. I remember our, um, uh, probably our favorite, uh, Michiko Kato from Hokodate in Japan. And Michiko, in her final weeks in Australia, planted a tree on the Beaumont Common opposite to where we lived. And um, uh, she rang mum and dad, 30 odd years later. Uh, so she, the, plea, the tree would have been planted about 1975 and said, I'm coming back to Adelaide. Anyway, there was a lovely photo of Michiko alongside the tree that she'd planted uh, many, many years before and it was somewhat larger too. Uh, but Michiko, uh, Michiko loved Theverton Rotary Club and Rotary generally and uh, and benefited enormously from it. So, but uh, so my reason for being here is, I guess, that connection I've had with Rotary. I've never been a Rotarian, but uh, that connection I've had with Rotary through family, which I've personally always enjoyed. And um, the loss of my son in 2009, uh, which is the year Dad retired from Rotary, and um, the uh, Jack, Jack died in 2000, uh, sorry if I get emotional by the way. Um, I do miss him, but um, I'll get through it, don't worry. Um, the, uh, Jack died in 2009, meningococcal disease, and the, the, he was a year 12 uh, student at St. Peter's College, he was a prefect, he was vice captain of his house. Where's Mr. Sarah? He was in Costa. <laughs> Hello, Don. Uh, he, he was in the Costa, which is good. Um, the Sarahs and the Clemics have got a good connection with the Costa, haven't we? Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, he was gorgeous. Um, 
He was a very fit, healthy young man. He uh, was a good football, good cricketer. On the Saturday before he died, he played football for the school um, down at Sacred Heart. It got a flogging, and um, as you do down there often. And on Sunday morning, he woke up with a headache. The headache got worse. We had a locum pop in uh, to have a look at him. They, the locum said, look, sorry, don't know what's wrong. You've got a nasty headache. Just you know, take some Panadol and see someone tomorrow. And in fairness to the locum, meningococcal was really, 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 really hard to pick up. There was no rash. There was no, he just had a bad headache. Um, <clears throat> headache got worse, ambulance, off to Royal Adelaide, semi-conscious, and uh, he was pronounced brain dead on Monday. So it was a tough time. Um, it was quite high profile, but the Crows wore black armbands for him. He knew a few of the players and uh, Everyone was really good. Um, he had a funeral at Saints, uh, St Peter's College. Uh, about 2,000 people attended, uh, which was just a blur. I don't, I don't quite remember it. Um, apparently, I gave the eulogy, which I don't remember giving. But um, the, you're sort of in a bit of a shocked, griefed daze. And I've got the bullet point grief here, and I don't quite know how to expand on that. Uh, I, my command of the English language is not good enough to uh, to really sort of explain how you feel. It's not good. I'm sure other people have suffered similar grief, but um, um, we're no, uh, not unique to that, but it, it, it is tough. It just is physical ache. Um, but, and you sort of think, gee, what now? This is real hard. And uh, you, you're worried about your wife. Um, Jill was really struggling, and obviously, and uh, you worry about your marriage, you know, a lot of marriages, you know, don't survive trauma like, like that. Um, but we're coming up for, for 40 years, so we, we've done pretty well. Um, the, you worry about your daughters, they, they were, when Jack died, we were 12 and 14 at the time and uh, went through a lot of trauma. Uh, they're now 25 and 27 and they're doing well. Um, you got a mortgage, you got to pay every month and you've got school fees, you got to and you, you've just got to keep going. You've got 35 people at work that rely on you. You've got clients sort of ringing you. And, you know, they only give you a week, week or so to get over it. And uh, 13 years on, I haven't got over it. I still struggle, as you'll probably see in the next few minutes. But the, the um, sorry, my time is gone. Uh, anyway, you sort of, you just battle on. You just have to really get up and get the kids to school and Jill, and poor Jill, poor Jill. Um, she really, it's hard, real hard. Um, and I got a call from this delightful lady called Helen Marshall, Professor Helen Marshall. I don't know if any of you know her, but she's the current South Australian of the year and she's an absolute ripper. And she does vaccine work and research work and I could go on about Helen for my full 25 minutes, but she's a legend and a delight. And she rang and said, Oren, um, we've, they had a daughter at Seymour, we, our daughters went to Seymour, and we sort of knew her through Seymour. So, and she rang and said, look, I just want to let you know that meningococcal's coming up in the press pretty soon, and uh, there's going to be an announcement made that a, there's a vaccine being trialled, and it will be available soon. And I said, does it work? She said, it sure does. And uh, it was quite emotional. Um, and Helen, Helen's just a delight. And uh, she, she sort of said, look, would you help us promote it a bit? And I said, of course I will. And um, so when it came out, they just wanted to speak to a family who'd been affected by meningococcal. And, you know, in support of the, the vaccine and encouraging people to get the vaccine. Now, the vaccine didn't become available for another three years. Um, it was very expensive to make. It was very expensive to, to get from a GP. It was about 600 bucks for a course of the, the vaccine. So if you've got three kids, $1,800 is a, is a pretty big whack for a disease that's pretty rare. About, I, w I think South Australia used to lose about five people a year, uh, of which Jack was one in 09. But there's a stack of them that get it and lose limbs and become brain damaged and, you know, it, it's a shocker. It's horrid. So anyway, just by, I don't know, default, I became this advocate for ninja cockle. And uh, every time there was a ninja cockle death, the press used to ring up for a comment and all of this. I sort of became this spokesman for ninja cockle. 
don't quite like that happened, but it just evolved and um, it, it went on and uh, then the vaccine became available, so I was sort of pushing people to get that done. A lot of people did, um, but obviously, again, at 600 bucks a, a child, it's pretty hard to uh, justify for a lot of people, and fair enough. Um, then, just before the 2018 state election, uh, I, I sort of went to health ministers and shadow health ministers and sort of tried to rally this amount of money, which allegedly was about $30 million to, to get into our health system. And uh, they, none of them were overly interested. They sort of pretended they were, but they never really did much about it. Um, and I'm not actually bagging them because they turned out to be fantastic. And um, just before the 18 election, uh, Peter Malinowskis, who was the then health minister under Jay Weatherall, uh, gave me a call and he said, look, if we win the election, uh, which obviously they didn't, but if we win the election, we're going to bring in this meningococcal vaccine. Which was good. And uh, I rang Stephen Wade, who was Shadow Health uh, for the Libs, and uh, he said, look, we'll do it too. And I said, well, can you say it out loud like the Labor Party are going to this weekend? He said, no, we won't. I said, well, I'm doing a press conference with them. Anyway, Peter said, would you do this press conference talking about, you know, as a family who's lost a child through meningococcal, which I did. And I said, I'll do it on one condition that you and the Premier don't stand behind me and nod. <laughs> Jeez, I hate that. I just hate it. He said, oh, I can't guarantee that. And I said, look, that's my condition. He said, oh, I'll speak to Jay. I said, OK, but please, I'd rather you just you know, I don't want to politicise this, so, but I'll say some really nice things about your policy, and which I did. And uh, sure enough, I got up and Peter said a few things and the Premier said a few things and then I, I said a few things about what a great initiative this was. And um, I commend the, uh, the Health Minister and da-da-da. And I, you know, I asked the, the Liberal Party whether they'd do the same thing and da-da-da. And immediately, you know, if you, you feel someone on each shoulder and and the, you just you can feel, feel air movement from the nodding. Um, and you look around and sure enough, there they are. But look, they were good. Peter Malinowskis was terrific, as was Stephen Wade. And um, uh, anyway, the Libs won. Uh, I think the first phone call that uh, Stephen Wade got as the new health minister was from me. And I said, right, when? And uh, he said, don't worry, Aaron, we'll do it. And I said, look, when? And he was good. He said, ah, oh, two months. I said, oh, I'm gonna hold you to that. And uh, I said, what's the process? He said, we're gonna get money from Treasury. I've got a meeting soon, and uh, that's gonna be one of the items on the agenda. And anyway, uh, I said, okay, I'll give you one, one death. Uh, after one death, I'm coming for you, and I'm gonna make life tough. And um, he's a delight, Stephen Wade. And um, he rang me about six weeks later and said, we're doing it. So it's good, really good. Um, thank you. But, but I really think um, Malinowskis is a really good man and Stephen Wade is a really good man and they get a lot of bagging, but gee, they're good people. And uh, they both, they brought this thing in, you know, the, the Labor Party said we'll do it, Libs said we'll match it, and the Libs did it even actually better than the Labor Party were going to. They, they uh, got vaccines for all these kids in years um, 10, 11, 12 for, the, for a couple of years, and then did all the, the, the newborns. So, uh, and the newborns are still getting done. So Ninja Cockle will hopefully soon, South Australia will be free of it. And um, so it was just, just nice to you know, turn this horrible negative into into a into a positive, and uh, and you know, I don't know. There's a there's a part of selfish grief management and all this. Um, you just sort of want to do something to to stop you feeling rotten. So and and it does help. It really does help. It it does help. So. Uh, um, but it's been good for Jill and me, and uh, she gets a bit emotional with it, as do I, as you can tell. But, but um, and through all of this, um, Jack also was an organ donor. He, he registered as an organ donor. He, he, he ticked his driver's license, as hopefully everyone in this room has done. 
And um, he uh, he just got his driver's license uh, just a few weeks before he died. And uh, he took the box and he, he said to Jill, uh, uh, what, what's, um, what's organ donation? What? And Jill said to him, oh, look, if you, something happens to you, uh, the doctors you know, can give your organs to somebody else that needs them, that's going to die. And um, he said, oh, all right, tick. Uh, he was left-handed, tick. Uh, so he was a registered organ donor. And when he was in Royal Adelaide on life support, uh, brain dead, um, which is how you need to be to be an organ donor, perfectly healthy organs. Uh, the question comes, they did it better than this, but they said, can we have his organs, please? And we said, yes. And his organs went to four people. Um, and we don't know who they are. It's all anonymously done. And, uh, but um, we recently wrote a letter to his four recipients, uh, and um, which you can do, again, it's anonymous. You, wrote, you send the letter to Donate Life and they send it out to the, we got a note back saying that one of them's died, uh, but one of the kidney recipients has died, but he got off dialysis and he had 10 years out of hospital and had a good, something else got him, they didn't say what, but um, Jack's kidney gave him a much, much better life. And anyway, we sent the letters off and we got one back, um, a reply back from Jack's liver recipient. And um, he, it was gorgeous, this letter. It's, here I go again. Um, probably the nicest letter I've ever, ever received. And it was to Jill and me and all our family. And um, it, to a, we're called a donor family. Um, and uh, it was lovely. It just said, I'll, oh, because our letter said, look, Jack was fit and well and he loved football and loved cricket and he was doing his last year in school and, you know, hope you're doing well if you're reading this letter. And he wrote back and, and said, look, I was very young. I was two weeks from dying. Uh, I play footy, I play cricket. And uh, long story short, you know, God bless your son and God bless your family. It was a gorgeous letter. And you, you think, gee, this is sort of worthwhile. Um, we could have said no to, to the request, can we have his organs? Even though he's registered, the family still has the last say. Um, but I'm so glad we didn't say no, uh, because uh, look, had Jack not been registered, we probably would have said yes anyway. I've always been a, a fan of organ donation. It seems silly to bury or cremate perfectly healthy organs. But um, the, and I don't know, as the years rolled on, Jill and I sort of became also advocates by default, really, uh, for organ donation. And we're often asked to speak at functions and, uh, you know, stuff like that. It's really hard work doing it, but it's just emotional and, it, you know, but, but, it, but it's good. And you sort of, you, you realise a lot of people, I, want, I remember going to Ross Trevor and speaking to about 300 boys and and the note came back and every 300 of them had registered as an organ donor and it, it's just remarkable and um you know it, it's really good because the one thing is if you're registered as an organ donor we get nine out of ten so so what happens 26 million people in this country i don't know 200,000, whatever the number is per annum die but only believe it or not, 1,200 Jack Clemmick equivalents die in hospital on life support as you need to be. Uh, 1,200 a year are able to donate. Now that's a lot of organs, you know, if we get four organs out of 1,200 people, but of the 1,200 that we could get, only 600 say yes. But if they're registered and they've told their family Trevor, if you're registered and you said, Rita, if anything happens to me, make sure you say yes. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, we get nine out of 10. So there's always a few grieved ones and people might say, that's terrible, they shouldn't, you know, but it's a shocking moment in your life. It, you, the, it, it's a horrible moment in your life. So I can understand a lot of people, you know, saying no. But, you know, if we could, so we get about half. So if we could get that 600 up to 800, you know, there, there's another, you know, 200 families that say yes to organ donation, and it's another 800 organs. 
So another 800 people whose lives we save or get off dialysis or whatever. So that, that's sort of what I spend a lot of time doing now. And um, uh, I was asked to be on, as Jeff said, on the, the board of the Organ and Tissue Authority and how a ex Woolworths employee <laughs> and uh, um, he was a very efficient manager, by the way, Trevor. I bet he's efficient here, am I right? <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. Um, the, um, but uh, how come real estate agent was on this board in Canberra amongst these extremely intelligent doctors uh, who spoke language that I still don't understand to this day? Um, because the board had to have a donor family on it. We're a donor family. I had, so, and I was somehow picked as the donor family for that board. And I've been on that for about four years, I guess, and I really love it. And uh, we meet, I don't know, six or seven times a year in, uh, uh, in Canberra and report ultimately to the federal health minister who's uh, recently become Mark Butler. So the, um, but it, it, it's good. The South Australian figures are spectacular. We are really, really good here. We're the best in the nation because we've got driver's license registration. And because we've got 73% of the population registered, we get a really, really high percentages of families saying yes when that opportunity arises, as it did for Jack, as it did for David Hooks, uh, brain death, life support, and um, you know, on it goes. So, the but um, I really do enjoy it. So I I, I can uh, as hard as it is, I enjoy it, um, uh, and I'm trying very hard on the board to get driver's license national again. It used to be national. South Australia for, is the only state that has it. And our figures, you should see the figures, you, you should see how much better we are than the Northern Territory. And, and, and Victoria is very good. Um, Tasmania is very good. Queensland are terrible. Western Australia are terrible. And New South Wales is really average. Um, and so, but we, our success rate, when a, a Jack Clemick is in hospital on life support, uh, they get about 80% in, in South Australia, which is miles above the rest uh, because so many people are registered. So, but look, um, thank you. I, I've, uh, I hope I've sort of taught everyone a, a, a teeny bit about, um, about organ donation, about meningococcal, about the vaccine and how it came about. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you don't mind me wearing my father's uh, Paul Harris. I'll, I'll take that off very shortly. Um, but in honour of him, I thought I'd pop it on. But um, most of all, thank you for listening. And in honour of my son, um, it's really nice to talk about him and what we've achieved in his honour and just making sure his death wasn't in vain and, 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 and just helping people with meningococcal and uh, organ donation. So thanks heaps for listening. Sorry I got a bit cheery. I always do. But uh, it's an absolute honour to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Oren. It was hard to listen to as it was, I'm sure it was, to actually speak to it. Um, we just have a few minutes left because we, Oren was, we let Oren speak a little bit longer. So if we do have any questions, um, then feel free to, if you're happy to take a couple yes. of questions, sure. Thank you. Rob, you always ask a question. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Believe it or not, you go home glad you've done it, even though it's tough at the time. Yeah, I know you and Jill have had an awful ordeal. Oren, uh, what you're doing is wonderful. I just wonder the average age of this club, let's say it's, I don't know, is it 70? <laughs> with, with your work on the, on the board, does, does the age of the, the, the donor have much effect on the longevity of the board? I, the, I um, wondered that. The, it, it depends. If you're a registered organ donor, Rob, um, the uh, the doctors really review how you 
organs are functioning. Now, I'm sure your liver is absolutely pristine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but the, um, basically, you strike me as a pretty healthy dude. The, the, uh, um, your, I don't know how old you are, um, but we can put, we, I'm not a doctor, but we, we, can, we can put an 80 year old kidney into an 80 year old body. It doesn't have to be, you know, it might, but it's amazing. And that 80 year old that's been on dialysis for years and years and years and had a, can't go on holiday, can't go into state, you know, gets, gets five years maybe from a, from a donated kidney. They're doing a lot more at that. They're doing, getting a lot better at that now. So please don't feel you're, you're, you're too sick or you're too old. Uh, if, you, if your organs are no good, um, they couldn't use Jack's heart. I think the ninja cockle did something, put the heart under stress and they didn't want to risk putting a heart that might have had some damage into, a, into somebody that needed a new heart. So, but other than that, his pancreas, his liver, his kidneys, his, you know, uh, uh, all lungs all went around. So in answer to the question, yeah, no, no age barrier. So just, if you're not registered because you think you're too old, just register. Just Google Donate Life. Thank you very much for your heartfelt presentation. Oh, thanks, Jill. Please don't feel that you have to apologise for getting teary, but that's an aside. <laughs> um, darling, there's been some discussion in the media recently about giving um, recipient families the um, opportunity to contact a donor family directly, not anonymously. Just mm. wondering your personal feelings about that. Thank you for asking. Um, the board I'm on, uh, and I'm, this, I'm not taking their side on this, but, but I think it's the right attitude. Um, I would rather, I, I've got the ability to write to Jack's recipients and they can write back. I don't really want to know who they are, is my opinion. Um, because there's been, believe it or not, there's been a lot of disappointment, like Jack Clemick, organs go to, I don't know, his kidney goes into someone who Oren and Jill Clemick don't approve of. Now, we wouldn't be like that. But, and also there's a lot of recipients that have, and a lot of donor families have not left the poor recipient alone. Uh, I think it's better being anonymous. I really do. Uh, the letter I got, if I, I, if I had more time, I would have brought it and read it, but um, that's all I need personally. There are a group, there's a group called Donor Families Australia in Perth who um, are very, very pro uh, the recipient and the, the family getting together and knowing who each other is. And I don't agree. I really don't. I, I think it's better being anonymous. You can have all the contact you like through letters, but then if they write to you, you don't have to write back, and if you write to them, and three of ours haven't written, oh, sorry, one died, but of the three that are still alive, one wrote back, the other two didn't, and that's okay. They didn't want to. And um, there's a lot of guilt sometimes with the, with the recipients. They feel guilty that they've taken an organ from someone who's died. And uh, a lot of, uh, it's, it's better off being anonymous, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Adelaide, I'd like to thank you, Oren, for your presentation today. Thank you. And as a um, token of our appreciation, we have a certificate for you from the thank you. from the Thevenin Rotary Club and a Rotary Teddy Bear. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. So you can much. actually put that in a place of pride next to your father's um, Paul Harris Fellow. Thank you very very. I will do exactly mm. that. A reminder that all money raised today goes directly to Rotary Community and Youth Projects. Your presentation helps make this possible. Can all members and guests please stand and give Oren the applause he deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.